Hey, 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 welcome to another episode of Becoming More Me. I'm super excited today to introduce you to Tasha Blank. Tasha and I came together because she worked with me as a private client for a large portion of 2023. And I love her work so much and she's so much fun and I wanted to really highlight her creative entrepreneurial spirit today. So Tasha is a celebrated international DJ, a somatic practitioner, coach, creative mentor, founder of the Powerhouse DJ School, otherwise known as PHDJ, and founder of Body Language, a global dance party reviving the soul of nightlife with a uniquely raucous, sexy presence and rich culture of respect. Tasha's animation through movement is a wild invitation to your most powerful expression. Oh, I love that. She's known for liberating hips in New York City's most legendary clubs, Cielo, Output, Verboten, House of Yes, the world's wildest festivals like Envision, Lightning in a Bottle, Burning Man, Wanderlust, Beloved, and museums, churches, helipads, boats roving desert ships, and forests and mountaintops all over the place. Tasha is also the driving force behind Powerhouse DJ School, a leadership academy empowering a new breed of DJ through artistry, creative discipline, ritual, the body-mind connection, event production, and everything else emerging DJs need to ignite the kind of dance culture we didn't know we needed. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Tasha. Hey, Tasha. Thanks for joining me today. Hey, Teresa. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to have this conversation because, you know, we've gotten to know each other a lot over the last year doing work together. And I'm really excited to hear more about like your work and things that we didn't necessarily get to go into as much when we were deep diving into more personal things. So um, I'd love it if you could start by just telling people a little bit about, you know, your, your day to day life. Obviously, we've already introduced you in professional ways here. But like, where do you live? What do you love to do? What's your day to day like? Oh, my gosh, what a question. You know, it's it's been changing pretty consistently and constantly for the last three and a half years. I used to have a quite a regular schedule living in New York City, um, hosting lots of events and DJing there and dancing. Like I really had my rhythm and then pandemic hit and everything changed. And I've been on a kind of wild adventure ever since and really just landed in the last few months with the intention of creating more regularity in my life. Um, I'm based now in Nevada City in California. Um, I came here because it's a small town in nature with a big dance scene and really just was after a few years of lots and lots of travel, constant change, um, constant adaptation. It's like, I just wanna be somewhere that my nervous system can heal. <laughs> <laughs> and like find its equilibrium again and where I can also dance and where I can DJ and, you know, feed that element of my life as well. Yeah. Cause you travel a lot. I know so much. We were working together. I felt like every time we'd pop on zoom, you were in a different place. Every time. I also, I joke with, um, I run this school called PhDJ that's mostly online and we meet twice a week. And I often have joked in the last two cohorts that I have a different background every single class. <laughs> the last cohort, I was like, okay, whoever can count the number of backgrounds I've had <laughs> gets a prize. It's, um, it's been, you know, it was necessary because I was doing a lot of different things in a lot of places, but my, my, I've, and I'm a double Gemini and I'm ADD and I, you know, like all these things. I love variety. I love, yeah, I love like, you know, being excited and having lots of experiences, but this year really taught me just the value of slowing down and simplifying and how much better I can show up for my work when I'm in one place. Everything. Yeah, yeah. sure. So what led you to creating the amazing business that you're running today? And I also oh wonder gosh. too, because I know you have like a huge passion for dance, but like, was it dance first or music first, music first, dance first, which was it? That is a really interesting question. You know, they, 
I really think they can't be separated. I think it's like a, a phenomenon of our society that these things get separated and that actually we get separated from these things. Yeah. You know, this idea that people have like, oh, I'm not a dancer or, oh, I'm not very musical. Like these are innate abilities that we have. It's just that we don't live in a culture that necessarily nurtures them. But traditionally, if you look at any indigenous culture, pretty much everybody dances, everybody drums. Like it's, they go hand in hand and they're just a part of everyday life. So when I look back, like I go back to my earliest days, my parents were playing, they, they took a huge um, trip and studied actually music in Africa in the seventies. And they brought back a lot of records. So it was always either African drumming records or jazz records being played in my house. And my dad likes to joke that as soon as I could walk, I was like doing ballet moves randomly, even though I had never been to a ballet class. So it was always in me. Um, but as far as when I really stepped into pursuing them, I would say I was a dancer first. Um, I think I was quite intimidated by music and dancing came a little bit more naturally to me. Um, I started taking dance classes when I was 10 or even actually before that, and got really, really serious about it. It was like pre-professional company, got out of school early every day in high school to dance. And it wasn't, um, it wasn't until I'd had a huge journey with dance and quitting the, you know, the classical dance world and then returning to my own dance through festival culture um, and finding electronic music and starting to throw dance parties that eventually I realized that in order to make these parties work, I had to learn how to DJ. Like if I was going to make them financially sustainable, I was, you know, I was throwing these parties, I was paying DJs, I was paying musicians and I was walking away with, you know, probably a negative account balance at the <laughs> end of the night for myself. And I was like, geez, if I actually want to create something that supports me, I have to learn how to do this. So it, I kind of was forced into it. It was like, if I wanted to keep going, I had to learn how to DJ. I really was intimidated by it. I didn't think I, I'm not a very techie person. Um, not really into computers. I was, you know, I didn't have records. I didn't understand how one became a DJ, but it really was necessity that put me on that path. And then it turned out it was like the funnest thing I'd ever done. So then how did you learn? Um, it was, Actually, my partner at the time had some old DJ gear that he traded in and brought home a controller and put it in my lap. Because at this point, it was really getting ridiculous. I was like throwing these parties. I had multiple people in my life tell me that I should be a DJ. And it just didn't, it didn't even compute. Like it just went right past me. <laughs> and he, yeah, it wasn't until he brought it. He like sat it down in my lap. He's like, you need to learn how to do this. And I had a panic attack. And then after I calmed down from the panic attack, I unboxed it. And um, I took one lesson in person and I taught myself the rest. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Do you play any instruments or sing or anything like that? I sing and I did play piano growing up. I did forget that part. I, I begrudgingly played piano from when I was about six until I was 12. And I hated it. <laughs> I did not like sitting in that chair and doing scales at all. Oh my goodness. So yeah. I know we both have like placed high value on nervous system regulation. Um, can you share how like somatic practices contribute to like the personal transformation on the dance floor with DJing? Yeah. I mean, dance is a somatic practice. Like it in and of itself is a nervous system regulating practice if we allow it to be sure. you know there's there's the dance of doing choreography and trying to get moves right and looking in the mirror and that can be regulating it can also be dis <laughs> dysregulating um but really when when we put ourselves in an environment where the intention is to feel what i'm feeling in my body and allow it to move trust whatever that is inside of me like to do it for me, that is a healing experience. It is, that's what leads to catharsis, to trauma release. Like it's, it's the most efficient nervous system regulating practice I know of, um, aside, aside from maybe EFT. 
um, pretty great. <laughs> yeah, they're both really great for different things. And that's why I'm so passionate about about holding that kind of space is because it's like, if I want to make the biggest impact in the world that I possibly can, literally the most efficient way I figured out how to do that is to put people in a room together and have them move their bodies. Yeah, that's awesome. And then I guess the other question is like, how does this relate to the development of DJs, like through like um, PhDJ, the school that you run, um, you know, you're empowering people with things like, you know, somatic and trauma healing tools and ritual mm -hmm. and like creative disciplines and such. So how do you feel like those components really develop like a different kind of, of DJ? Yeah, it's, I'm, there's so many different kinds of DJs. There's, there's different, really different kinds of nightlife. There's the, the nightlife and there's the DJ scene that completely takes you out of your body and disconnects you. And like, you feel worse the next day. Like that's very real. And that's, that's a lot of places. Um, and then there's the kind that's much more rare. That's actually held intentionally, um, and creates the opportunity for people to find safety in their bodies and connect to their bodies in a way they may never have before. Um, and it was really, you know, there's so many things that were, I was always a nervous system regulation junkie from when I was probably about 19 or 20 years old. And I started getting really into holistic healing. Um, and then I was also at the same time figuring out that dance really, really helped, you know, so that I was like doing these different modalities and these different techniques. And I was also finding dance and I started just naturally incorporating some of the things that I was learning. Like the, if I go to an acupuncture session, I would pay attention to how the, or the energy reorganized itself in my body. And then I would take that lesson onto the dance floor and play with like, how do I do that through dance? Um, I started going to net things like network chiropractic, doing different body work modalities, and then taking that, those lessons onto the dance floor and seeing how, um, how can I use these ways I'm, I'm learning to use and move my energy off the dance floor and bring it onto the dance floor. So my dance, like those modalities started really expanding my dance and it gave me access to places on the dance floor that I didn't know could be accessed, you know, like the places that usually you would need to take psychedelics or something to, to get to, but really recreating um, it without. yeah, I really, it was like, these are all switches in our brains, you yes. know, they're like, they're just different pathways we can hook into. And yes, it takes more discipline to do it with just being sober and doing it through rhythm and movement. It takes, it takes patience and attention but it's really doable. And I also find that when you do it that way, the lessons can be integrated more easily. And we tend not to like blow out our circuits um, in a way that can take a long time to kind of come back and be like, what, what just happened? And how does that actually apply to my life? Yeah. You have any like specific examples or like even like exercises or something that you could like walk through in this audio kind of environment? We have video too, that like hmm. really help to I don't know, like something that people really enjoy doing on the dance floor or that you really enjoy doing to help people kind of like get out of their mind and into their body. The biggest tool that I would give is sound. Like breath and sound are such a huge part of my own personal dance practice. I think a lot of times people forget to breathe. You know, we're sitting in front of computers all day long around these screens. We get really disconnected from our breath and we start breathing really shallow. And to have a movement practice, especially a freeform dance practice where the breath is really part of the movement. Like I'm not just moving my hips. I'm actively bringing, I'm like inhaling into my hips and yeah. exhaling through my feet and playing with how does this breath become a part of the choreography that I'm improvising. And then to expand on that, to allow sound to come out with the exhale. It is one of the quickest regulating tools I know, quickest ways of releasing trapped energy. Like it's when we get these 
stuck places in our body, if we breathe into like, let's say I have a tight neck or a tight shoulder, if I breathe into my tight shoulder and I just exhale and let some sound come out, whatever sounds there, it could sound weird, just whatever wants to happen. It's literally going to alchemize that energy out of my body and it's going to move it and I'm going to feel a shift. And what I find on the dance floor is when I do some kind of vocalization, not like a The key is to not try. The key is to not be like, ooh, you know, like make a sound that's kind of coming from my mind, my thinking mind. It's like really letting it come from my body. Mm -hmm. When I do a vocalization that comes from my body instantly, I have more access to more movement because I've literally just opened something up. So that's something that, you know, it's easier to play with in your living room or maybe not in public, but yeah, I know. I, I normally do like, like yoga nidra meditations and things in the morning when I'm getting up. And a lot of times I start making like noises towards the end of it. And my husband's always like, when I first heard it, he's like, what are you doing over there? <laughs> like, oh are you yeah. Having are you having fun without me? Um, you know? Oh yeah. Oh, my partner's, my partner's gotten really used to this at this point. He's like, oh, she's, she's making weird noises over there. Okay. That's uh-huh. good. <laughs> yeah, no, my husband's totally used to it now too. But when it first started, it was kind of like, all right, what's happening over there? But yeah. I kind of explained and he's like, okay, now he knows I'm usually like in a very good mood when I finish uh-huh. making my unusual noises on the other side of the bed. So yep. yeah, sound is definitely underrated, especially mm-hmm. the sound that we emit from ourselves. That's for sure. That's right. Yeah. I love that. How do you, um, how do you see the connection between like somatic movement practices and the achievement of like big goals and aspirations? Oof. So for me, the thing that stands in the way of my big goals and aspirations is myself, (laughs) is my nervous system, is my mind, is my fear, is my comfort zone. And every time I expand and get more successful or reach more people or develop how I'm serving, my nervous system tends to freak out. It's like this, like I'm a super duper sensitive. Like I cried on the first day of kindergarten. I cried on the first day of third grade when I went to new school. Like my nervous system is just, she's just a sensey little, little something. And so I've really had to get used to like every time I'm setting the intention to grow and expand. And every time I'm stepping into something new, I have to show up to my practices. I have to be dancing. I have to be tapping. I have to be actively upgrading my nervous system so that my body can keep up with my being. (laughs) Because it tends to be the slowest part, right? And I think that for a lot of people, it's it's really our stuck patterns in our nervous systems. It's the stuck stories in our minds that keep us repeating the same loops or keep us, you know, repeating the same patterns in our lives. And the quickest way to short circuit those loops is to get into the body and shake it up because they're, you know, the body and the mind are not separate. They are the same thing. And when you affect one, you affect the other. And so it's this sort of bottom up approach to interrupt the thought loops by Yes. interrupting patterns in the body. Absolutely. Love yeah. that. And I know, you know, we've talked about this a lot in, in, you know, sessions and things, and the audience is always interested in this too, about like shifting paradigms, going through portals, all that kind of stuff. And um, can you share any kind of like personal or professional experience where you felt like you went through like a transformative portal and how it like shaped your journey? Oh my gosh. Every week. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, it all, is. all the time, never yeah. ending. Yeah, um, especially as a highly sensitive person, it's like I there's a lot of change, and I feel all of it. Um, gosh, well, I mean, feel free to like double click on any of this, but I would say the biggest portal was when we lost in person dance floors, and you know, all of my livelihood was based on in-person events. Like that was how I made my income. And so, and I didn't even, I didn't know if that was ever coming back. I don't know if you remember, but especially in New York city, there was a moment where I was like, are we never going to dance together again? Yeah. And I sort of, in order to get through that moment, I kind of had to just make peace like, okay, this may not be a thing again. 
um, in the same way that it was. And I had to really let go of that, that life. And I was living, it was very much a dark night of the soul kind of time. I lived in the woods for six months and I was doing lots of virtual broadcasts and, um, yeah, just like all the, the clubs had gone away. The big sound systems had gone away. The, the big DJ persona had gone away and it was just me DJing for people on zoom, like people who signed up to, to be in really the intention was healing with these dances and, you know, we were all stuck in our houses and just trying to find some semblance of center. And it was through that, just showing up to that practice over and over and over again for 18 months, <laughs> holding space virtually without any of the fanfare of the, like what I had been used to, oh. that I realized what I was doing. So um, for 10 years of DJing, I thought that I was just intuiting every DJ set. You know, I was just feeling my way organically and letting it, you know, emerge. And it was through all of those virtual broadcasts that I realized that I had a method. I was like, oh my gosh. It was actually a day that I was dancing to one of the replays that I had done. And I had this moment of insight. It's like, I do the same thing every time. I follow the same map every time. And I saw what it was. It's actually kind of like an overlay of a few different things. And I was like, oh my gosh, I can teach this. Because before I had been trying to figure out how I had this really successful party in New York called the Get Down and like sold out every other week for years. And we really wanted to scale it. And I really wanted to like bring it to other cities and I wanted to make it bigger than just me. But I was like, I don't know really how to articulate what I'm actually doing that's creating this experience for people. And the irony was like, it all had to go away and I had to be living alone in the woods, just doing a zillion DJ sets to be like, oh my gosh, I know what I'm doing and I know how to teach people. And that's where PHDJ was born. So, um, you know, I was making a very long story short, that portal of like extreme loss and thinking that my life as I knew it was over was actually the doorway into realizing what I had been wanting to create, which was a movement that goes way beyond me standing behind the decks that actually empowers other people to step into their leadership and gives them all the tools that I've learned over the years. And like, you know, they get to skip over all the hard lessons that I had to learn the hard way um, and really empower a new generation of conscious dance leaders who are exquisite DJs also um, to create more dance floors because thank goodness we did get our dance floors back. Yes. And, you know, I don't think we're ever going to let that happen again because oh. we realized how much we needed, how much we needed just to be together. And like the, the value of being in a space and moving our bodies together, that simple act regulates us. And is like an essential nutrient, I think, for most humans. And so, yeah, the, the intention right now is really just empowering more and more leaders to hold more of those kinds of spaces. That's awesome. Do yeah. people need to have any DJ skills in order to come to PhDJ school? Nope. That's one of my favorite things about it is that we get all kinds of folks who are drawn to it. I mean, it's if you look at the website, like this is a very particular program for a particular kind of person, not just somebody who wants to learn like the basic DJ skills off YouTube. You can you learn them off YouTube sure. if you want, if you want to learn how to mix and just mix in your bedroom. Um, this is really for people who want to hold space that changes people's lives. And so we get people with amazing backgrounds, like therapists and professional dominatrixes and like just people who have really, really deep backgrounds in lots of things, but not in DJing. So really important piece of it is we have the first segment. It's a skills boot camp. It's just a few weeks long and it's really like, all right, we're going to get everybody on the same page here with those basic DJ skills because as I learned when I started as a technophobe, um, you know, rem remembering that panic attack I had, um, 
It was awkward. There was a learning curve. Like there's no way to know what the buttons do before you know what the buttons do. And so I had to get over that hump, but it actually wasn't that big of a hump and it didn't take as long as I thought. So we have spent a few years now refining like how to hold people through that process, especially when they're first starting out. And it's really doable. It's really, really doable. And then we can get into the funner stuff. I might just have to come learn how to DJ. I don't know. Oh my God. You would be an amazing DJ. <laughs> <laughs> it's so I, fun. I always see what you're doing. And it's always like, I am enjoying kind of living vicariously through what I see. I'm like, Hmm, sure. I'm sure I could learn a ton from you, but um, yeah, it's, it's so cool. I, I love it. And um, you know, I know that when we started working together, you always said how EFT was something that like just jived with you. Like it just really like released things in you very easily and everything mm -hmm. else. Um, you know, what would you say were some of the the big takeaways through like the work that we did together with mm -hmm. like EFT or hypnotherapy? Like what things did you find that shift? And I asked this for a specific reason because kind of like your work, you had to have to explain it because people don't really get it on the outside. I feel like a lot of times people think hypnotherapy, EFT, like where does this take one someone? Like how does this actually, you know, impact or change or whatever? And um, I think when people tell their stories, it like makes it all make sense for mm -hmm. both, of our, both of our work. Yeah. Yeah. What I love about EFT is that it really bridges the mind and the body and it releases things on a level that is below the subconscious, but your consciousness is also present for shedding old beliefs. And like, I find also that it unlocks things from my subconscious and allows them to rise up to the surface where I'm like, oh, that's what that is. Oh, there's the tears. Oh, it's that this is why I've been feeling so weird. Um, and it really allows myself to sort of unwind all of the stuff that gets kind of packed down and in and tease it out and understand it at the same time as I'm literally helping my nervous system process it out. And yeah, I mean, that, that was an incredible, it was really incredible to be held by someone else. Cause I'd been doing EFT for myself for years and doing videos, but to actually have somebody like you who's super tuned in and like, actually like really channeling, I think you're channeling when you're guiding somebody through a session and being able to get insights that I wouldn't be able to pick up on super helpful to be mirrored. And one of the biggest pieces that I loved of doing our work together is I think it really empowered me to start um, holding other people with EFT, specifically my dad, as you know, um, who went has been going through a lot the last couple of years. He was just diagnosed with Parkinson's and yeah. he is a Freudian psychoanalyst and psychiatrist. Um, he's 88 years old. He is uh, very cerebral human being, very heady, very logical. And, you know, he's, he's cracked open in the last couple of years because of everything he's gone through to be open to new kinds of things. So he was willing to try EFT and his response to it is extraordinary. Like it shifts his state so drastically in you know, anywhere from three minutes to 20 minutes. Sometimes we'll do longer sessions. Sometimes he really doesn't have it in him to do much, but I'm like, how about we just do one round? And he does. And every time he's like a changed human being. <laughs> oh, that makes me so happy. I love yeah. things like that. And it often makes me wonder if I should be having a certification program or something, but so many people that have gone through just like the one-to-one -one work or just the becoming more me with EFT program end up using it in their work because, yeah. you know, little known secret, you don't have to be an EFT practitioner to, you know, provide those services or to help people through the modality. So I, I love that it has that ripple effect and that it continues on. What kind of things do you tap on with your dad? Oh, my dad. Well, I mean, that's, it's his stuff, but it's like a lot of anxiety, a lot of stuff yeah. about health and aging and energy and not feeling well. And it's yeah. everything from like physical stuff to emotional stuff. And it really, all of it works. And it's actually, I love, I love doing 
holistic-y things with skeptics, um, of which he <laughs> is <too>. one, <laughs> because you're like, oh, this really works. Like, it's not because he just thinks it's working. It's because it actually works. Yeah. yeah. I would say with EFT, especially, it's like, try it on something that's tangible. And then yeah. you'll know for sure. You know, the first time totally. you try it on a body ache or a pain or something that you can really shift there in the moment, then you have a lot more belief in it being able to help with the fear or the anxiety, those kind of things, um, mm -hmm. or things that might have to wait to be tested until a later time. So mm -hmm. that is so cool. I love that. And um, yeah, I'm always so excited when I hear about those breakthroughs that you're making with your dad and all the time that you're getting to spend with him too. You know? Yeah. You've, you've done so much in this last year, you know, with your family and everything. And it's beautiful to see that. So I've been yeah. part of witnessing that. Totally. Um, well, the EFT has really brought us closer together. You know, it's a very intimate thing to do with somebody. And it's, it's such a privilege to be able to hold that space for him. It's, yeah. it's wild. It's super trippy. The whole thing is like... <laughs> It always, happening especially right now. when you're working with family, you know, I've yeah. got limited work with family members myself and it's always like, it's a little strange, but it's also really cool. You know, I got to yeah. hypnotize my mom recently and, um, and having her kind of go back and regress through things was just like, so emotional, you know, mm. just, I mean, cause you know how it is. You can pull things out like they happened yesterday and you know, that can be a long time ago when you're in your mid seventies. So, you know, and it's like, wow, like mm -hmm. you're still carrying that around. And it mm. really inspires me to want to clear even more of my own, you know, stories and shift my paradigms and everything else. Cause it's like, I don't want to be carrying that stuff around a few decades from now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> totally shift, shift it shift it shift it so what how do you choose your music how do you like pick <laughs> your sets and like what are your influences i love you shared a set um on instagram like last month from like the 12th of december or something and i had so much fun listening to it it was like my background jam for like my work nice. for a couple of days because when i was i start listening to it and then i would get distracted you know adhd i'd come back and listen to some more and i but i like kind of like looped it for a few days and i really enjoyed it how do you how do you dial in on what you're going to present Oh, well, I have a whole seven, it takes me seven months to answer that question <laughs> <laughs> in this school. Um, it's, it's a lot. There's a lot that goes into it. Like I treat my sets. Um, I mean, it's nice to have a set sometimes too, where it's like for a party in a museum where I'm doing the background music or something. It's like, I just get to have a good time and like, it's just about the ambiance, but for sets where I'm really taking people through a journey, um, I take it super seriously and I work on them for a while with the preparation. And it's, it's really about creating a journey that's going to meet them exactly where they are and allow them to find safety in their bodies so that they can start to open up and unwind. And from there, it's taking them into all the different corners of their being and creating opportunity for catharsis and um, really emerging with many of the parts of ourselves that we disconnect from and then experiencing the release that comes after that and the opening and the expansion and then ultimately giving them the opportunity to land and integrate all of it so that they leave not just having been rocked and, oh, that was a cool experience and now it's done, but like, oh, I'm actually shifted at a cellular level. Yeah. And I understand, I, I've got to come to one of your events one of these days, but so I could actually experience it. But from, from what I understand, it's, there's a lot of like free expression and everything else. How do you get people to like express themselves so freely while still having that like sense of like respect and connection maintained in a large crowd of people? Mm, such a good question. Another one that takes seven months to answer, <laughs> but yeah, it's that like, you're really hitting on, on the heart of so much of it is creating that kind of space. And, you know, I think when we are really connected to our bodies we're all connected. So we're also connected to everybody else in the room and our animal bodies, when they're truly present, are aware of what's around us. And it's actually only somebody who's disconnected and a little dissociated, who's going to have a kind of catharsis that really interrupts or impedes or gets in somebody else's way. You know, I've had so many 
really phenomenal experiences on the dance floor where I am completely out of control in that my mind is not controlling what I'm doing. I am moving faster than I can think. I can't even really see because my my eyes are kind of half closed. It's a room full of people and I don't touch anybody. Even though they're super close, like there's some kind of intelligence when you're truly connected that actually takes care of everybody. And cultivating that is what takes a little bit of time and intention um, and and nurturing the kind of space where people can find that for themselves is a huge part of the work. Yeah. For me, I think it would come down to a lot of like self-trust and intuitive connection. And sometimes I feel like that would be like in my mind, I'm thinking, hmm, how do you get that in a whole room of people in like in an instant like that? That's where mm -hmm. I'm kind of going to. Not that I completely understand that it's possible, but I'm just. Yeah. I mean, I, I think and like uh, just to get more practical, it's like really about actually being in your body, because mm -hmm. I think most of us are not actually in our bodies. We are in our heads. We forget that our feet are even touching the ground. Like we're not feeling 360 degrees of our bodies most of the time. And when we take a moment and some time and, and create a container wherein our brain has permission to relax and turn off and we actually get to, to let our consciousness and our attention go down below our neck, like this body is so full of intelligence, so aware, like it can feel what's around us 360 degrees like we evolved to be able to feel very very sensitively so so much of it is really about like it's the discipline it takes a lot of discipline and it's so different from our usual day-to-day -day life and consciousness just because of how things are now but to go back into this level of awareness that we were born with like we evolved with it <laughs> to be actually fully all the way in our bodies and fully aware of our surroundings, um, it is really doable. And it does have to do with trust because I think that we're also trust taught to not trust our bodies and that we have to control our bodies and we have to be um, dictating and inhibiting what our bodies are doing or else we might get punished or in trouble or we might embarrass ourselves or something. And actually healing that relationship with this incredibly intelligent system that like contains 14 billion years of evolution inside of it is so much a part of coming back into wholeness as people. Yeah. Sometimes we get a little bit more stuck on the 14 billion years of generational <laughs> trauma. <laughs> right. That too. <laughs> Whatever else. So we get stuck in that instead of that, the, all the innate intelligence and all mm -hmm. the, all the things that are just also just readily available at our fingertips. That's awesome. I love that. Mm -hmm. How can people find you if they want to learn more about this stuff? Yeah. Different ways. Uh, TashaBlank.com is like a hub for all the things. PhDJ.dance is the website for PhDJ. If folks are interested in the program, there is more information about it than you will ever need on that website. And then, of course, Instagram, Tasha Blank, Powerhouse DJ School, and Body Language is the brand of parties that I run and are. It's really more of like a production platform for events at this point. And yeah, I'm there. I'm super findable. Also on SoundCloud for those who want to find my mixes. And this is all if you were to go to um, my Instagram and click on my link in bio, like it's okay. all linked. But my SoundCloud has like hundreds of hours of DJ mixes in there and dance journeys. And it is amazing. Good stuff. Yeah. And you share the best memes on Instagram. So it's just worth the follow. Even. <laughs> Thank you. I try. It's an, it's another, you know, art. It's like a, a solid hobby of mine is meme collection and curation. <laughs> I can tell you're, you're quite good at it. They always, <laughs> they always resonate with me. I, like I always get a giggle or an aha moment when I, when I see them. So thank you for sharing those. And thank you so much for being here today. Are there any like wrapping up thoughts or things that you want to share as we're kind of finishing up? Oh my gosh. I mean, I think that so much of all of it comes down to actually showing up for our practices. You know, for me, like I knew how to do EFT and I came to work with you because I was like, I need somebody to kick my ass and really <laughs> force me to show up to, 
to do this because it does work. Like dancing does work. If you were to dance every day, your whole life would change. Yeah. Everybody, if they dance every day, their whole lives would change. It's just that we don't do it <laughs> because there's so much else going on. So um, it's easy to acquire information. It's easy to acquire practices. It's easy to go to a bunch of workshops and then not integrate them into our lives. It's really about what we incorporate into our day-to-day -day practices that creates the change. So that's yeah. what I would, 100%. that's what I would end on. It's about doing it. It's great advice. It is about doing it. And it's about using these sorts of things that we're both talking about in our businesses to get out of our way so that we can do it. Because mm -hmm. so many times we know we want to do it and we're still just stuck there frozen, not doing the thing or showing up in the way that we don't want to show up. So figuring out how to do it. So awesome. Thank you so much for everything that you shared. I love this conversation and I appreciate you being here with me today. It's such a pleasure. Thanks for having me. for spending some of your precious time with me today. If you love this episode, please leave a review or simply share it with someone else who would get great benefit from it too. If you share on social media, please tag me so I can personally connect and thank you. Until next time, keep taking bold and brave steps towards becoming more of who you want to be in this world. You are capable, you are worthy, and you are enough. And if your inner critic is still trying to argue with those facts, hit me up. We've got work to do.